welcome back to Let's Get Haunted with your host, Nat Strawn and Allie. Welcome back, guys, to episode 83 of Let's Get Haunted. Welcome back, everybody. Wow, we're here. We're here. Do you we're notice, doing it. Do you notice anything different? You guys, we have a YouTube episode. This episode is filmed. It's not just audio only. Mm -hmm. So if you are listening on an audio only platform, you can go over to youtube.com forward slash C forward slash let's get haunted to watch our beautiful or ugly, depending on your preference Uh faces (laughs) yeah and um we also need you to listen on both platforms for us because we need to continue to keep the audio streams so that we can continue to get sponsors because we might have a sponsor coming up soon (laughs) god stay fucking tuned everybody it's also a very random sponsor so um really gonna need you guys to support this choice that we've made to feature them on the show yeah does it make sense Time will tell. I also think it would be a cool move. So like when you get sponsored by people, they Mm -hmm. usually send you their products or yeah, they send you their products so you can try it. So you can be like, I like this or whatever, or I don't like it. And then they don't hire you again. Yeah. (laughs) So if they send us stuff, I feel like we should do a giveaway to like give it to fans. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it, you guys. Uh, And you may be asking, well, Ali, I thought that you said that you weren't going to do video again until October. We couldn't stay away from you guys. Yeah. We really couldn't. It's honestly, once you've had video, it feels like going backwards. It does. Yeah. We were, Natalia and I were texting last night saying like psychologically something about going from video to audio only like felt backwards. like a step back. Yeah. 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 And we got to keep the momentum going. Right. We've got to keep morale high. We're an independent podcast. Morale That's is true. often <laughs> low. So <laughs> we're going to bring back the video. Morale is often super low. Go right. ahead and leave a comment uh, on here. Boost our morale. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, and Natalia has freckles this episode and I am loving it. Oh, and I just want to point it out to can everyone. You, I'm mesmerized. If, I don't know if people can see it on the camera. Uh, I don't think they can. Michael, don't zoom in. <laughs> Wait, you know what? I'll take a photo. Maybe I'll take a yeah. selfie after this. Yeah. Um, also, I want to do a nail cam. Look at my nails. Whoa, are those Godzilla nails? Sorry, I just screamed and I heard that really look, loud in my ears. Look, I know you guys can't wow. see this, but I'll put a picture oh later. Oh my God, we'll they're, add this in post. They're dragons, but God, could be Godzilla. It. Wow. So, my nail art lady. Oh God, that's so she, fucking cool. First of all, an amazing lady. Her name is Royu, and she's Japanese and she works at this place called Marie Nails on Third Street in Los Angeles. Shout out. And they use like special Japanese gel and like everything's imported and it's just better and amazing. So, if you want like sick nail art, highly recommend going there. Um, but the last time I went in, I got those faces. Yeah, remember? those faces were really cool. The Belmez faces. Yeah, and I thought I was being like super original and artsy. Like I was like, oh yeah, it's like Picasso. Like I'm really doing something here. And then when I, she was painting them and they were all done, I was like, have you ever done nails like that? And she was like, yeah, all the time. <laughs> and I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, all the time. Like, and the way that she said it was just so bored. Like, yeah, oh my it was God. Like, I'm, I wish that someone would come up yeah. with something creative for me to do. Yeah. And then like, I took personal offense to that because I like to consider myself someone who's like original and creative. And so like the fact that my like cool original idea was just like done. had been done a million times before to the point that like this artist was bored of doing it just felt like a stab through my heart. So then I really thought I went home and I was like, I've got to pick something so original. It can't be like anything anyone's ever done before. And then I was like, I'm going to do the Eye of Sauron <laughs> from Lord of the Rings. And then I Googled it and it had already been done. And then wow. I was like, fuck, OK, I'm going to do a dragon with the Eye of Sauron in his eyes. And then I was like, couldn't find that. So I was like, OK, that that's a cool one. And then I brought it into her. She did it. And I was like, so have you ever done something like this? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, what? What? And I just had to be quiet for a second. Just dying inside. And I was like, when did you do something like that? And she was like, oh two years ago and then she just like took a picture of it and she's like thank you bye (laughs) and I was like well we need to figure out who that person was and have a stern talking to them and say where did you come up with this idea I mean like what can I put on my nails that hasn't been done before a butthole simply (laughs) no I don't want simply I think that that's what you're gonna have to do because I penis absolutely been done before yeah but butthole post hole on me that's right (laughs) Yeah, you guys. What's what's a uh, personal hauntings going on with Alyssa right now? Uh, well, the only personal haunting in my life is that we are drinking oh. this episode. Now, don't worry. This is not beer, or is it? But yeah. it's not. It's coffee that Natalia brought 
mm-hmm. from your home, I believe. Yeah, so my <laughs> my apartment complex has like a free coffee maker that I definitely like abuse that those privileges. It's like an espresso, so it's the pods, you know, oh, that yeah, you put I've in. Oh yeah, used that before. Yeah, and they're like they're like nice, you know, like that's not yeah. something that you should just do all the time, I feel like. But Treat I like yourself. do it all the time. I bring coffees for my friends. I like bring coffee to everyone. Um and so I brought it for Alyssa today and Thank you. we put it in these red solo cups. Um and now it looks like we're drinking beer or wine. It could be it could be anything. It could be. It could be. You'll could never be know you unless you can see what's in the cup, which I don't think you guys can. I don't think the angle goes like that. It is so. coffee. Um. So yeah, I want to. That's talk- it. Yeah, that's all. That's it. That's all that's going on with me now. Unless you have another personal haunting, I do. You do. Okay. Yeah. Go okay, ahead. This is going to kind of make me sound like a garbage person, but well. It's a interesting Welcome to topic. Let's Get Haunted. So first of all, I feel like I'm cursed lately because the apartment building that I built that I live in, so they have like a facade on the outside of it. It's like mm-hmm. glasses that are like people's balconies are like glass, right? So um, one day I'm out of the house and uh, a really loud bang happens and like all this glass is like shattered outside and we're like, what happened? And it turns out one of those facades just came loose and fell on our back patio. That's final destination I shit. I know, where we sit all the time. Like it happened right next to There's this like- you like, could have died. We would have been decapitated. Or like, what if we were out there with the baby? We're constantly out there. And so we were like t- emailing the building and we're like, hey, what the fuck happened here? Like we should sue them, right? We're like, what the fuck happened here? And they're like, oh, uh, just one of the glasses from above fell, but we cleaned it up. Don't worry about it. And I was like, literally <laughs> we would have died. Like we would have been decapitated. Yeah, yeah, no, that is final destination. So then coming up that night, my fiance and I are going on a date and he's like planned a date, which never happens. But I was like being a bitch for all week and like, you never take me on a date. So he finally did it <laughs> and he was like, we're going on a date. And I was like, great, we got a babysitter lined up, all of this stuff, super excited to go out. And he's like, we got tickets for a show. We're going to dinner and then we're seeing a show. And I'm like, what show are we seeing? And he's like, we're seeing Hamilton. And I'm so excited, I've never seen Hamilton. Hamilton. I'm like super pumped up to go. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we go to Hollywood. We like get all dressed up, valet the car, all of this. We go have dinner, excited. We walk up to Hamilton. Then we get to Hamilton and we see there's a big sign that says you need to have your like negative PCR test with you or vaccination card with you. And they just didn't put that when you buy the tickets. So like half of the people that were showing up didn't have either of those things because they just didn't have those. And so then we had to get a refund on it. And we were like, well, fuck, we are already have a babysitter and we already have like this night we're supposed to be having a date what like what should we do and Cody is sober and I am not drinking because I'm like breastfeeding so we were like well fuck what should we do and he's like do you want to go to this strip club and I was like oh yeah I guess so then we go to this all nude strip <laughs> club at like 7 30 p.m we're okay I do have a question because you texted me about this and I'm very yes. curious were the entertainers the female entertainers yes. wearing masks no. That is so interesting to me. No, they were not. Because LA has an indoor mask mandate. So oh, that is oh, so interesting to me. Sorry. No, no, no. I'm no, I'm sure there's an exception for dancers. And that's why it's interesting to me. Because right. I'm like, what are the oh, exceptions to the rule? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Wow. I hope you tipped them handsomely because we did. We they're made it. being the most exposed during a we pandemic. We made it rain. Well, Cody made it rain several times. I feel weird about making it rain. I just like set a stack of cash on the side. Right. Because I, uh, I don't know. Because as a woman, you're like, is it degrading if yeah. I'm like like machine gunning out ones right. at like, your tits if i was drunk i would be like this is fucking great like and not right. care but i was just wait thinking about it way too much because we were like bone sober at like literally 7 30 p.m but i made friends with one of the dancers she was really cool and then to end this haunted story she yes. convinced me to be a vegan <laughs> Well, there you go. Yeah. So I've been trying to do that for like two days. Who knows how far I'll get, guys? Well, you've been vegan before. So this is just, yeah, a return to your roots. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. We'll We'll see. I wish you well. Thank you. And stripper conversations are the best. I do remember a couple years ago, we went to a strip club for my friend's birthday. And 
I like bought a dance from one of the girls because she was talking to me about aliens. And I was like, yes, women supporting women. I will, you know, pay for a lap dance. And then the whole time we were just talking about UFOs and it was wonderful. Yeah. I was just talking with this girl about like what her workout routine was, like what her skincare routine was, where she got her extensions, like what she does for fun. Like, you know, when you see someone that's just like perfect and then you become obsessed with them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Like I could not stop myself. And then she was said she was a vegan and I was like, I'm a vegan now. Yeah. Like, yeah, she, if I can look like that, sh- I will do whatever you're doing. Shout out to Aria. You're probably never going to see this, but did if you, you tell do. her that you have a podcast? Oh no, oh. I was like, don't know how to talk to a pretty girl. Like, yeah. I just get really weird, and I'm just like, tell me about yourself. <laughs> Well, at least you were asking questions. I feel like women don't normally get asked uh, questions beyond surface level, so I'm sure right. she appreciated that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was a real one. Well, speaking of pretty girls, pretty guys, and pretty people in general, it's time to read off our August donor list. Did you know where I was going with that? No, I had no idea. Yes, I am the queen of segues. And this month, I would love to shout out John and John, Alicia C, Elena B, Leah H, Gwen C, Bella E, Amanda S, Elena B, Barb, Axie, James H, Haley A and Maria O. And I have to give a very special shout out to Barb who donated $100. And wow. she wrote, this Canadian senior, me, has taken up painting in retirement. And as I do, I listen to your podcast. I'm on my third time around. I find your conversation at the beginning to be my favorite part. Continue bringing laughter and joy and spookiness to us all. Heart, Barb. Barb has listened to the entire catalog three times. Or just oh, three episodes. I don't know. Barb, let us know if it's three times, like thir- three times of everything or three times. She said this is episodes. my third time around or unless she meant her third time around the Us. earth. Oh, like three she, years old. No, like she had been <laughs> reincarnated. Reincarnated. <laughs> She's sorry. Reincarnated. Sounds like you got put in a meat grinder. <laughs> Y'all. Barb, we appreciate you. Thank you from yes. us to you. And let us know if you meant your third time around the sun, your yeah. third time being reincarnated, your third time listening to our whole catalog, or third episode. Right. Yes. We're very interested. We're very interested. And I want to shout out Brielle S., who is the only person who donated to me. Thank you so much, Brielle. Brielle, I appreciate you're it. the best. Thank you yes. to everyone buying merch. Mm-hmm. You can go to letsgethaunted.com if you'd like to buy our summer merch. We have tank tops. Tank tops. Enamel pens. Enamel pens. Stickers. Stickers. We got them. You want we tank got, tops? We got, we got them. them. You, you want, want stickers? We have those as well. What about enamel pins? I would love an enamel pin. Got them. Wow. Now what, how about a poster? We also have that. You want it signed? It is. <laughs> Now, would you like a pencil? We don't have that. So, no. no. But maybe we will. Maybe. Never mm-hmm. say never, as Justin Bieber says. Right. So next on my agenda, I would just also like to thank everyone who has donated to the Let's Get Haunted Lupus Foundation of America fundraiser. Right. We've raised $570 so far. Whoa. The goal is to raise 1000 by October when Natalia and I are going to walk 10 miles. And... I would love to shout out the names of yeah. the people who've donated yes. so far. Yes. Okay, wait. I have shamefully not donated yet. I was just about to say that before you That's said you were going to say the names. And now that I know you can see the names, I have to donate. Yeah, so now I? you can't just be like, oh, yeah, I, I did that. <laughs> nope, I can see. So I would love to shout out Elena B., myself, Amber O., anonymous donor, anonymous donor, anonymous donor. Oh, you, can, you can pretend. Yeah. <laughs> Caroline H., who is our friend in real life. I get very yeah. excited when people I know IRL pay attention to us. Hal B., Jacob O., Jesse H., Maria O., Patricia M., Robin Hood, what? Sean H., who is also another person I know in real life. Thank you, Sean. And Zach M. Thank you guys so much for donating to our annual fundraiser. Yeah, thanks, guys. You guys yes. are amazing. Now, as I told you, Natalia, mm-hmm. I do have a witness for this episode that we are going to cold oh, call God. later. I are, like we haven't filmed in such a long time, so I already feel like awkward and like not in my body oh, right now. I, yeah, the video episodes, I always feel awkward, yeah. but we got to do it. We got to push through. Now Alyssa's doing this, like bringing in haunted energy and like what are you? What are I you am. doing? I'm bringing in some very haunted energy for this episode. But my point was, we need to get started because okay, this Do girl it. is on a time limit. Okay. She will die soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the story is about. No, just kidding. Okay. 
Are you ready to get haunted? <laughs> I'm super ready. Let's go. Let's get haunted. Comment below if you're ready to get haunted. Come hum. below if you're ready to get haunted. Comment hum. below if you're ready to come below and get haunted. Right. Okay. Here we go. Jumping into it. Jumping into it go. in three, two, two one. one. Here we go. New Jersey. <clears throat> Who is she? Who is she? What does she want? <laughs> New Jersey in the late 1960s was a hotbed of paranormal activity and UFO sightings. Mm. 1966, in particular, was a very active year, with many people from all different walks of life from all over the state reporting unidentified objects in the sky and on the ground. For example, on January 11, 1966, at about 6.30 p.m., Police officer Joseph Sisko was out patrolling the streets in his cruiser when he got a call from dispatch saying the following. People in Oakland, Ringwood, Patterson, Totowa, and Butler claim there's a flying saucer over the Wanake. What is the Wanake? According to an article by Weird New Jersey entitled UFOs Over Wanake, Joseph immediately drove over to the Wanake, which is a man-made reservoir. Thank you for asking. Okay. After the call came in over his radio, quote, I pulled into the sand pit, an open area to get my bearings, Cisco recalls. There was a light that looked bigger than any of the stars, about the size of a softball or volleyball. It was a pulsating white stationary light changing to red. Mm. It stayed in the air. There was no noise. I was trying to figure out what it was. Hundreds of citizens, policemen, and even politicians in the area witnessed the pulsating white phenomenon in the night sky. Joseph, still at the sandpit, still staring up at the sky transfixed, was shocked back into reality when another call came in over his police scanner. Quote, something's burning a hole in the ice, something with a bright light on it going up and down. Then another transmission fought its way through the den. Oh boy, something just landed in front of the dam. No. Word reached the civil defense director of the reservoir, Bentley Spencer. He immediately drove over to the 1,500-foot Raymond Dam, where, according to his own words, he saw a, quote, bolt of light shoot down as if attracted to the water, like a beam emitted from a porthole. No. That sounds like a spaceship. It's, you could be correct. In fact, I'm going to say you're correct. According to John Shuttle, a town councilman who witnessed the UFO, I saw it, a bright, brilliant, white object, two to three feet across, and its color, no, not color, its Mm. shade, it kept changing. Despite U.S. government involvement, the source of the phenomenon was never explained. Meanwhile, similar odd sightings, including a, quote, bright white disc, an egg-shaped disc, Mm. and a white light brighter and larger than any star and moving in a pattern (gasps) no natural object could make, no. Continued through the winter, summer, and fall months. No. Culminating in an event on October 10th, 1966. I said it before and I'll say it again. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Monday and shortly after 9 p.m. when the first sighting came in. According to Weird New Jersey, quote, Wanake Police Sergeant Ben Thompson was driving his patrol car south along the reservoir at the time. Thompson looked out of his car and to his astonishment, saw the UFO heading right towards him. (gasps) I saw the object coming at me, he said. There was an extremely bright light. It was a bright white light, bright like when a light bulb is about to blow. No. It was very low, and it appeared to be about 75 feet over the mountain. At this point, other motorists along Westbrook Road also began to notice the strange light hovering in the sky and slowed their cars to get a better look at it. With so many witnesses from all over the state seeing the same thing, it is impossible to deny that something strange was afoot in New Jersey in 1966. Okay, so you're telling me there's a Wanake, which is a man-made reservoir. I also could be pronouncing it wrong. It's spelled W-A-N-A-Q-U-E. Could be Wanake. Could could be Wan... That's it. That's all I can think of. It's either Wanake Wanake or Wanake. Yeah. Okay, there's a man-made reservoir. Yes. Why don't they just call it that then? Because it has a name. Okay. There's a man-made reservoir. It's in New Jersey. There's a policeman named Cisco. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you got he it right. saw some UFOs there, bright lights in the sky that were different than the stars, moving in different patterns. And also there were other people who also saw the same thing in the same area that corroborated his story. 
Correct. So he in actually, 1966. In 1966, in January of Did 19- I get an A plus? You get an A plus plus. Okay. And I do have some photos that accompany this little story within the story. So hell yeah, Michael, brother. If you can, <laughs> if you guys are new to the show, we are Hulk Hogan. So yes. hell yeah, brother. And we would like to see the next slide in hell our slideshow. Yeah, show. brother. Heck yeah, mother. So this is the first slide I have for you. Oh. This is the patrolman's car pulled off to the side in the sand pit. This looks like prime men in black as well, times. It definitely does. I mean, it's a black and white photo. Mm -hmm. And it's from 1966, as I said. And this is overlooking the dam. Okay, so I'm going to describe this photo to our visually impaired listeners. Um, It is a photo that features a large dam. For some reason, I was thinking of a reservoir as being like one of those things at the front of a neighborhood, like a pond that like Mm -hmm. catches a runoff or something. And it's like really small. No, this is really, really big. It looks like it's um, probably, oh, I don't know, maybe like 800 meters long or something like two laps around a track, perhaps, perhaps a little bit longer. Um, And then it's like, yeah, like a waterfall coming off of that. And then there is one of those 1966 men in black style cars that's just like hovering on the edge there. Yeah, it's parked on the side. And then so right over that dam is where if we go to the next slide. Now, allegedly, this is a photo taken by a citizen of the UFO over the Wanake that night. And the photographer remained anonymous for 50 years. Yeah, because he sucks. Yeah. Well, also, <laughs> so I will say, as you guys know, with anything involving our show, we're just prevent- uh, presenting the information to right. you guys. I think this looks very sus. I doubt that this is an actual real photo. No, I was just thinking, like, this is a bad photo in that, like, you can't tell what you're looking at. But if it's a UFO with a super bright light and you're taking a photo with a film camera, it would be really hard to adjust the settings to get the proper photo. Correct. Yeah. Um, And this is 1966. It's definitely film. You guys, I took a film class in college because I was trying to be artsy and I couldn't get that shit to work when I had all the time in the world yeah when you had nothing to do but learn how to use the camera and i couldn't fucking figure it out so uh you know what to me this looks like a ufo with a tractor beam coming down melting a hole in the ice well perfect and as i was saying the author the photographer (laughs) remained anonymous for 50 years but finally a man came forward claiming to know the photographer in 2017 so if we go to the next slide this according to dailyvoice.com's journalist jerry demarco claude coton was the photographer and some people say this photo is a hoax and unfortunately we can't ask Kotan because he passed away well before his identity identity was revealed as the alleged photographer well the second photo looks more legit than the first photo right so this is a restored version of the photo if I'm not mistaken yeah um and as I was reading this article apparently the way this photo came to be is there was a woman dating a man who now we believe is Claude Kotan and he gave her this photo and said, hey, remember, like this this area that he was working in um, was like right next to the dam. And he's like, hey, remember that time there was this UFO above the dam? Well, I took this photo. And then he's like, you can have it if you want. And so she was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Anyway, they end up breaking up. And then now she gives this photo 50 years later to some other guy. And then that guy reaches out to the dailyvoice.com's journalist, Jerry DeMarco. That's why I say that photo is getting people laid. You gave that photo. He gave that the original dude gave that photo to the woman. And he was like, look, this photo of this alien. And then they started dating. They broke up. You can you use your own imaginations. What happened there sounds like a very short term relationship. And then later she used the photo to get into a new relationship. With I that didn't. Guy. I didn't even pick up on that, but yeah. you're probably right. Yeah. And clearly, this photo wasn't good enough to warrant marriage. No. It's... But it is good enough to get laid. Okay. Just true question for you here. <laughs> true. Yes. True question. <laughs> um, if someone came to you and you were single and available to it, and they brought to you a photo of a UFO and you otherwise were not attracted to them, would that be enough? It would be enough to get them an interview (laughs) on our podcast, for sure. I would be very intrigued by that. But I would also be like that. But then would you secretly fall in love with them because they've had this UFO experience? I'd be like, are you radioactive? Like, is your sperm now like genetically altered? Do I not want that? Yeah. 
Yeah. I'd have to think about it. Superman, baby. I'm not saying no. I'm not ruling it out. Well, in fact, we're, we're ruling, ruling it, it in. in. Yeah. So continuing forward <laughs> on this, on the space-time continuum, um, yes. on the timeline of these as events. As one does. So as I said, this first event I'm ta- I told you about happened in January of 1966 right. in New Jersey. Then uh, the timeline continues. There's more and more sightings very similar to mm-hmm. that first sighting that happened all throughout the, the winter months, the summer months. And now we're getting into fall. Okay. Okay. On October 15th, 1966, a 22-year-old forester named Jerry Simons was out on a camping and fishing trip in Farney State Park mm-hmm. when he abruptly left his campsite, fleeing to a nearby home of a friend. Shaking, sweating, and chest heaving as though he had just run a marathon, Jerry appeared on the doorstep of Thomas P. Burns, a respected politician and parish leader of the local church. Alarmed, Thomas asked Jerry if everything was all right. Jerry's heart was pounding in his ears, and it took him a few moments to catch his breath. When he did finally speak, the tale he told was astonishing. Jerry had been fishing within Farney State Park at a reservoir known as Split Rock. When dusk fell, Jerry decided to pack his gear into his truck bed and drive back to his campsite, which was not too far away from his fishing spot, but just far enough to warrant a drive instead of a walk. Okay. As he drove, something caught his eye in his rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. Slowing down, Jerry focused on his mirror, trying to make sense of what he was seeing. There was a very bright, orange-red glow illuminating the back of his vehicle. Thinking it might possibly be his brake lights sticking, Jerry stomped on and released his brakes several times, attempting to shake loose whatever loose wire or fuse was failing his lights. Still, the glow remained. Jerry brought his vehicle to a complete stop and stuck his head out of the window, looking towards his tailgate. It was then that he realized that the reddish glowing light was not coming from his brake lights, or even from his vehicle at all. It was coming from something that was hovering directly above him. No. At first, Jerry thought it was just a light all by itself. Oh my God. But as he continued to stare, a shape came into view around the light. I'll crash that car immediately. <laughs> like, well, I'm not waiting to find out what's you're going at, on. You're at a dead stop looking up, and then you're just like, nope, and just crash <laughs> your car into the reservoir. Yeah. Like, I had a good life. Goodbye. Well, you want to find out what that is? Well, Jerry wanted to find out what that is. There was the distinct outline of a solid disc hovering silently and eerily above him in the forest. All alone in isolation, with reality setting in now, Jerry became terrified. He immediately floored it toward his campsite and drove off as fast as he could, hoping to escape the object. Unfortunately, the reddish light continued to follow him. Jerry decided to change directions and try to make it back to the main road, which was paved. Cutting through bumpy terrain and dirt paths, Jerry maneuvered his truck towards Green Pond Road. According to an article by columnist Anne Ganader for North Jersey News, Mm -hmm. the object was directly in back and above his car, and it was following him as he drove along the rough road. Oh my god, it just follows him like he tries to get away and it just comes with him? Yeah, he's zigzagging, he's cutting through the forest, he's cutting through dirt paths, and it continues to follow. If I had a gun, I would try to shoot that. He probably did have a gun because this is 1966. Right. Yeah. In in, uh, New Jersey. Right. In like a forest. Yeah. I would I would wager mm-hmm. if I was a betting man. Okay. Suddenly, his truck started acting abnormally and lost power completely. Oh, no. Without any warning, his headlights, dash lights, and engine powered down, and he saw the object hovering directly above him from the windshield. Try as he might, Jerry could not get the engine to turn over. Stalled in complete darkness except for the red glow above him, Jerry panicked. Then, the object seemed to move over him, retreating back to the bed of his truck. Suddenly, his headlights flickered back on and power returned. Jerry began to drive onward once more. His truck would stall and shut down a total of three times, and each time the car gave no electrical response until the object above him either moved to the rear or to one side of the vehicle. When the object was right over the top of his vehicle, all Jerry could do was lock his door and pray. At times, the object seemed to ascend higher, making the only thing visible from it the soft reddish glow bouncing off the trees and rocks of the forest to the right and left of the car. Mm. 
The times where the object ascended over him, the red glow would wash over everything and Jerry's truck would stall. When he finally reached Charlottesburg Road, Jerry looked up into the sky to see if the object was still with him. He could no longer see it, but the red glow inexplicably still remained, as if it were painted on the very air molecules surrounding him. No. After listening to Jerry's incredible story, Thomas wasted no time in phoning West Milford Police and New Jersey State Police. What are the police going to do about that? Well, I think at this point, they don't know what it is. So they're just like, somebody is flying something in the sky. Only in, like, scary movies do they not know what it is. Like, you see, like, a girl in the street with the hair covering her face, and she's like, "Ah, ah." and then the police is like, there's a girl out here, and I I think think she's she's lost. Yeah, I think she needs help. help." And and you're like, what the fuck? Like, run that bitch over. (laughs) So the police come. They come to Thomas's home, and they take down Jerry's report as, like, a firsthand report of what he saw. So Jerry, again, recounts his story. And the officers are dumbfounded because he, Jerry never changes his story. So they're trying to be like, really? Right. What kind of drugs have you been taking, yeah. sir? Were you drinking at, yeah. as you were fishing over at the reservoir? But Jerry is completely sober and he's not changing his story. And he's very credible because he has this kind of important job of being like this guy that works as a park ranger, which at right. the time was like, well, I think even still now, I actually randomly know a couple park rangers yeah. and it's actually a very difficult job. You have to go through this whole like training right. and like roughing it in the wilderness and yeah. seeing if like survival training and stuff like that. Yes, it so is. So he's, it's yeah, tough. it's tough. So yeah. he's a very credible witness. Right. And he goes straight to his friend's house, who's a parish wait, uh, leader. J- wait, Jerry is a park ranger? Yes. Oh, well, that changes everything. I thought he was just a civilian. No, dude. no, no. No, he's a park ranger. A, oh, wow. He's a twi- 22-year-old park ranger. So he was, like, working in this, like, reserve. Well, I th- think he was fishing. He was probably off duty right. or I, I But don't if you're know. a park ranger, that's work, right? Yeah, you're still in your place of employment. Yeah. So in a way, it's still work. So dumbfounded, the officers decided that the only logical thing to do would be to drive out there themselves and see if they could find the light. Once at Split Rock Reservoir, the group found that everything was dark, quiet, and still. Mm -hmm. There was no red light, no hovering disc, and no other person camping or fishing in the vicinity to talk to. It was and would remain an unsolved mystery. So the next slide in our slideshow shows what this reservoir looks like. So there's Split Rock Reservoir. Okay. And then the next slide in our slideshow... This is a sketch that Jerry drew for the police. So the caption of this photo for you guys at home, because I'm not sure how big it is on the screen. It says, after encountering what he believed to be a UFO at Split Rock Reservoir Mm -hmm. in 1966, Jerry Simons drew the sketch of what he saw. Yeah, it's literally a hand-drawn a hand-drawn UFO, like one of those like disc things. And then it has like a bunch of lines coming off of it, which I guess might be like showing the glow that was coming yes, off of correct. it. And then it set, has dimensions and it says 25 by five or six feet and 30. Yes. So he's saying it's like 25 foot long. I believe he's saying it's five to six feet tall by oh. his estimations and 25 to 30 feet wide. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's big. Yeah, it is really big. Now, all across New Jersey, strange sightings by the townsfolk continued. On October 16th, 1966, just one day after Jerry's UFO encounter above Farney State Park, two teenage boys were walking down the street around 9 p.m., about Mm -hmm. 30 miles away. The boys, James Yenshidis and Martin Munov, walked down 4th Street in the town of Elizabeth. James, who went by Jimmy in his youth, and Mm. Martin, whose nickname was Mouse due to his small stature, were good friends who lived just down the road from each other. Or maybe he was really good at sniffing things out. He could have had an affinity for cheese. We'll never know. But I read that it was because he was small. (laughs) It was a Sunday and the pair had been off roaming the concrete streets and industrialized neighborhoods of Elizabeth, New Jersey, as teenagers in the area often did. Hmm. The pair were walking home along 4th Street and New Jersey Street when they reached a corner located parallel to the New Jersey Turnpike. Okay. The Turnpike, which is elevated, butts up against a steep, grassy incline at this location. Oh, no. Steep, grassy inclines are bad news for everyone. A large metal fence runs along the street here, blocking the hill and the Turnpike from being accessed by pedestrians. Right. 
Although it was dusk, the bright street lights of the underpass illuminated the desolate roadway as the boys trudged onward towards home. As the duo reached this corner, they noticed a man standing behind the metal fence that blocked off the turnpike. He was illuminated by the glow of the street lights. The man seemed out of place, almost surreal. He was giant. Jimmy would later say that, quote, he was the biggest man I ever saw. Well, is Jimmy the tiny one? No, that's Mouse. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, if Jimmy's saying he was the biggest man he ever saw, he's a, that's he's a really a big fucking man. big guy. Estimated by Jimmy to be well over six feet, possibly in the seven foot tall range, with an extremely broad frame, the mm. man was dressed in a sparkling green coverall costume or suit that shimmered and shined and seemed to reflect the moon and street lights as if it were made of some combination of cloth and metal. There That's was old Greg. Old Greg from old Greg from that YouTube video. Yeah, I'm old Greg. Did he have a shiny green suit? Oh yeah, he was wearing like a ghillie suit that like had metal, had all kinds of shit in it. Oh. He was just like a bog man. Well, guys, uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, no time to explain. It's old Greg. <laughs> there was a wide black belt around his waist. The man was described as Caucasian but dark complected, as if he had just returned from a tropical vacation with tiny little round eyes that were set very far apart. Oh. In an interview given by Oof. Jimmy and Mouse sometime after the incident to author John Keel, the teens relayed the following. Quote, Jimmy nudged me, Mouse reported, and said, who's that guy standing behind you? I looked around and there he was, behind that fence, just standing there. He pivoted around and looked right at us. And then he grinned a big, crazy old grin. The man's smile was impossibly large, but the strangest thing about this figure was that he had no hair, no ears, no hands, no nose. What do you mean he had no hands? He just had arms with stubs on the end? Well, he's wearing a, a shiny green suit, so all they know is they can't see the hands. Okay. Okay. It was impossible to tell whether or not the man had any feet as he was standing behind the metal turnpike fence behind some scrub brush. As the man continued to smile crazily at the boys, they turned on their heels and ran the rest of the way to their homes. Good. The next Normal morning. Normal reaction. The next morning, a middle-aged resident living near the turnpike reported to the police that a, quote, tall green man had chased him down the same street that same night. And a witness account from that police report resulted in a description that was then Given this sketch, which is on the next screen. Ah, whoa. No. So this is an artist's rendition no. of the description given in the police report. What? First of all, no. Natalia, can you describe this to our I listeners, our audio listeners? This is honestly terrifying. Um, okay, so I'm looking, like, it looks like, you know, the Joker, like the 90s Joker yeah. that, like, has the big smile. It looks like that. Uh, ugh. I don't know how to describe this. It looks like that. He's got the a really like un, inhumanly hu and not human smile. Yeah, it's very alarming for sure. He has like no lips also. And yeah, and his eyes are, yep, super far set and small. And it kind of looks like Saw. It looks like the little jigsaw guy too. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? The puppet. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So this sketch comes from the middle-aged man who said that he was chased by this guy that same night that Mouse and Jimmy saw the strange man standing by the turnpike. And the reason why I mentioned that description of the turnpike being elevated and then there being like this super steep grassy incline yeah. is that as the police were kind of investigating all of these reports, right. they're trying to figure out, okay, what are the logical explanations? Yep. Could there have been a driver that was stranded on the turnpike? Maybe he lost power to his yeah. car and then somehow got down onto that grassy incline. Right. And as they were looking at it, they figured out like, there's no way. It's too steep. It's way too steep. Right. And especially because you can't get... Like, the whole point is there's this metal fence that makes it so that you can't get to the sidewalk down below, right. and then people from the sidewalk can't walk up to the turnpike. Right. It separates the traffic from the people. Correct. So if this man was stranded on the side of the road up on the highway, mm -hmm. he could have just looked down and been like, oh, there's no point for me to fall down this steep incline yeah. because I'm going to be trapped in a fence. Unless he wasn't human. 
unless he wasn't human. And the description from Jimmy and Mouse seems to indicate that probably he wasn't human because their description says no nose, no ears, no hair, no hands that they could see. And then the middle-aged man described what resulted in, in, a, a, green man. in a green man, a kind of thing that sort of resembles like the classic comic book Joker. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he said? No, because it wasn't around. Was it? No, no, no. But he gave a description that was taken right. down in a police report. And then someone from the internet made like a modern rendition of and what they envisioned. Like yeah. 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 It is really not cool. Right. I'm, not, I'm good on that photo. We can right. keep it going. Well, the next slide <laughs> does not get much better, unfortunately, because this is another what? artist rendition of what the man looked like. Okay. If I saw this man in person... You know what? This is it's weird. This is activating my fight response. So the other guy activated my flight, like run away. This guy, yeah. I just want to fucking punch in the face. It's a very punchable face, I will say. He just looks like a dick. Like, yeah. well, he, he has that hair that was really popular in 2015 um, that I would describe as like Pidgeotto for the Pokemon. The uh, it's like an um, you know what it is? It's like the Peaky Blinders like undercut. Right. Yes. Uh, I thought this was very hot into 2015. Oh, 2015. <laughs> absolutely. If you had this haircut, I probably went on a date with you in yeah, 2015. Yeah, but now, looking back, we're like, wow, that was a fad so for that the, no longer is uh, allowed. For those of us who um, don't aren't can't look at it, I'll describe it. How about that? It's got, I mean, what am I saying right now? This photo that Alyssa has presented me is right. of a man. It's who actually has, a drawing. It's not a photo. Uh, is a drawing. <laughs> it's a drawing of a man. And he has the sides of his face, of his head, um, shaved. And long hair on top. And he's like ma grimacing smile. He's got w way too many teeth in his smile. You know, I do feel very unfortunate for people who have natural smiles like this that are actually nice. Because when they smile, which they do a lot because they're nice people, it is scary. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely I think it's more of like an inhuman like face peeling back smile. It kind of reminds me of like the movie men in black if like something was crawling out of someone's mouth like the alien yeah. when he wears that skin suit and he's not quite sure how to like right. maneuver around and he's like sugar water or whatever right. and it's like face it's like you could see how something that isn't used to knowing how human bodies work right. might yeah like this is friendly yeah hi great i'm a green man <laughs> <laughs> hey come back here yeah yeah and he's got um, red eyes here, too. Yeah, this rendition, he has red eyes. Now, um, I will say that, so as this story progresses, we're going to talk about more and more different sightings around this time period of possible uh, entities or UFOs. And some of the sources I came across while researching these topics said, oh, well, we can't corroborate this story because we don't know who Jimmy and Mouse are. Right. This, all of this comes from like two sources. It's impossible mm -hmm. to track it down. Well, guess who tracked down Jimmy uh, and figured out who he is? I did. He's alive? So Jimmy is unfortunately no longer with us. His son, by the same name, is currently living. Um, and I spoke to him and he de respectfully declined to come on the show because um, he said that he just didn't think he would do his father's story justice. Right. I can totally understand. Yeah. That. But um, I spoke to him and he said that, unfortunately, his father passed away last year from COVID. Mm. So definitely want to extend our well wishes yes. towards him. And I really appreciate him talking to me because he he didn't have to. Like, yeah. I'm just some random person on the Internet. Um, but he said that over the years, his father's story never changed. Mm -hmm. That he definitely believes that his dad saw this um, and that his dad was a very good, honest, hardworking man and had no like didn't benefit from this at all. It's right. not like some people when they have experiences, which this shouldn't diminish the validity of experiences, right. but sometimes it's an excuse. Skeptics use yeah. like, oh, well, that person got paid to do a TV interview right. or that person got paid to go on a podcast, or, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Well, his you guys, podcasting is not that cool. It's not I'm lucrative. I'm going to tell you yeah. from personal experience. That's a minus if you have to right. go on a podcast. Right. But his dad had <laughs> his dad had nothing to gain from this is my point. Like he didn't right. go public with his story in a way that that even makes reporters say, oh, we can corroborate the story. You know, a right. lot of people were like, did he even exist in the sources like you I was reading? You had to do some hard work to find this person's son. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. So um, 
I just wanted to point out that like this is a real person. Okay. And his son confirms like yes, this is a real story. My dad's story never changed. His wow. his friend existed. Like these are real people who existed and this was like a very traumatic experience. As someone who has a father who has had paranormal experiences who I have yes, had that's on true. the podcast to talk about it, I do say that I for some reason trust dads a lot when they talk about UFOs. Well, yeah, and I also think maybe because you do have a dad that's had paranormal experiences, you yeah. can kind of sympathize with how Jimmy's son might feel. Right. Like, you know, you don't want your parent. I don't know. I, I feel very protective of my parents. Totally. So if somebody was kind of like making light or making fun or of making them. fun of, or being like, oh, they're crazy or they don't know right. what they were talking about. I would be very upset. Yeah. So I just wanted to point out that like these are real people who had this experience. Right. It sounds terrifying. Yeah. And I believe that Jimmy really saw this. Yeah. And that's. I don't like that. No. And so I just wanted to point that out because some of the sources I was reading were kind of making me angry because they're like, he probably didn't even exist. And I'm like, no, he's he's a real he's person. A real, it yeah. doesn't take that We long. will not have Mouse and Jimmy slander on no, this podcast. Absolutely not. Okay. Next next story in this timeline. So remember, we started the story Winake. in Jan January 1966. Yes. We worked our way down through the summer. Then we came up on this story in October. Okay. Now... We're in November. Okay. So less than a month later, on November 2nd, 1966, a sewing machine salesman named Woodrow Derenberger was making his way home after a long day of work. Although Woody, as he was called, lived in West Virginia, on this particular day, he was driving home from Marietta, Ohio. Mm -hmm. It was a cold Wednesday evening with rain coming down in sheets. It was a long drive. He was still on the road well past 7 p.m. and Woody was exhausted. His eyes were glazed over as he navigated through the implicate that let me say that again. His eyes were glazed over as he navigated through the inclement weather, his eyes bleary from a hard day's work. Suddenly, an object dropped out of the sky and landed on the highway in front of his vehicle. No. Darren Berger slowed to a stop, parking just a few feet from the crowd. No! What? Wait, whoa, hold on. You have to clarify. This person was driving and now sees a UFO and decides to stop? So the UFO is coming down over his vehicle. We're going to hear some more information in a minute, but is coming down over his vehicle in such a way that he has to slow down. So it's not... Uh, it's not... In order to not, like, hit, hit it. Hit it, correct. Okay. And then eventually the craft slows down, like, comes down over his vehicle so close and so slow that he has to come to a complete stop. Then the craft moves over in front of him and comes and lands right in front of him on the highway in the rain. And he shit his pants and died. Well, we're <laughs> we're going to talk more about his experience in a second. So in disbelief, he watched as the object opened up in front of him and a Caucasian man described as dark complected, just over six feet tall, possibly in the seven foot range with odd looking eyes emerged from the object and approached his vehicle. A Caucasian man got out of the spacecraft is what you're telling me? I What I'm describing to you is almost identical to the description that Mouse and Jimmy gave. Is it the same guy or is it like a species? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. So he wore a coat that was dark, trousers that were shiny and glistening that reflected light as the figure nonchalantly made his way towards him. Frozen in incredulity, the man approached Woody's passenger side door. Somehow, Woody heard a voice asking him to roll down his window, despite the man's lips not moving at all. When he did so, the strange man stepped forward, his arms crossed over his chest with his hands hidden under his armpits in a way that looked very uncomfortable. Like this? Yes, but apparently it was described as something that would be very unnatural for like a human. So your guess is as good as mine. The being then smiled an impossibly large smile at Woody. And what happened next was relayed in a local television interview by Woody Derenberger the very next day on November 3rd. Although I was unable to find the original television footage, allegedly it's in the Mothman uh, Museum in Point Pleasant, New Jersey, mm -hmm. I did find a YouTube channel by the name of Appalachian Oddity who uploaded the complete audio from the live interview, which we are going to listen to now. So if we can go to the next slide. Yeah. So this next slide is going to be a still frame from that television interview so we can see what Woody looked like. So here's Woody. Oh, He's wow. a sewing machine salesman okay. living in the New Jersey area. Totally. And the next... Just looks like a normal guy. Right. The next slide is going to be 
the audio version of that television interview that we are going to listen to now. And the person who uploaded this has captions. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can read the captions as we listen to this audio. Well, okay, so I'm going to go ahead, since we're having some trouble with the PowerPoint, I'm going to just play the audio here on okay. my laptop, and we'll add it in post. Oh, lovely. Our guest is Mr. Dernberger, uh, route number two, Mineral Wells, West Virginia. Oh, it's that old-timey language. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dernberger has Transatlantic a very accent. story to tell us this evening. I will give you a thumbnail sketch to begin Could be with. Not? Whether or not you believe in unidentified flying objects or not is not the point. Oh, I love that. Whether you believe in what you hear or see on this program is not the point. Say it louder. <laughs> talk to a man that allegedly did make contact with such an object within the Parkersburg area last evening, November the 2nd, 1966, at approximately 7.25 p.m. The incident allegedly took place on Interstate Highway 77, near the interchange of route number 47. This gentleman is a salesman in the area. He has been a resident of the area for the past 50 years, and he has uh, given us permission to interview him, uh, to show his face, and to call him by name. And this in itself takes a lot of initiative, and to be very plain, a lot of know-how. Mr. Dernberger, in your own words, would you please relate what happened last night? Well, I was, I am a salesman and I drive a truck. And last night, uh, shortly after seven o'clock, I was coming from Marietta, Ohio, coming down Interstate 77. And just before I came to the intersection of uh, Route 47, there was a car past me, overtaking me from behind. And following closely behind this car was this unidentified flying object and as the car ahead or the car behind passed me this object was following close behind it and it swerved directly in front of my truck turning crosswise and when it turned crosswise it slowed down it started slowing not abruptly or too fast but it gave me plenty of time to step on my brakes and slow down with it but it forced me to come to a complete stop as soon as I had stopped, there was a door opened in the side of this vehicle, and this man stepped out and came directly to me, or came to the truck. He walked to the right-hand side of the truck, and he told me to roll down the window. He asked me to roll down the window on my right-hand side of my truck, and I had done what he asked. And this man stood there, and he, uh, he first asked me, what I was called, and I knew he meant my name, and I told him my name. And uh, he asked me, he said, uh, why are you frightened? He said, don't be frightened, we wish you no harm. He said, we mean you no harm, we wish you only happiness. And uh, I told him my name, and when I told him my name, he said he was called Cold. That was the name that he was called by. And he asked me what the city of Parkinsburg, he pointed to the lights. He didn't point, but he gave the impression that he was pointing, and he asked me what that was called. And I told him it was a Parkinsburg, it was a city, a town. And he asked me if most all the people lived in my, this city or town. And I explained to him uh, that it was a place of business. It's where we transacted our business, that the people lived in communities, outlying communities, most of the people. And when I told him that this was a city, he said that his, where his home was, that that was called a gathering. And uh, again, he told me not to be frightened, which I was. I was, I was very frightened. And as far as I can understand, this was all mental. There was no spoken words from him. I knew what he was asking me, but yet he stood there and his mouth did not move. He had a smile on his face. He was he appeared very courteous and friendly. And after I talked with him a while, 
he told me he would see me. He said, we will see you again, and he left in his vehicle. Now, and Mr. Dernberger, for the sake of our television audience here, uh, the, the words that you used, cold, cold would be like, uh, cold is his name. This is how it sounded to you, that his name was cold. Yes. And the, the word gathering was like uh, we would know together or, or something like this. Yes, that's what he meant. That was the impression that he gave. And he did not move his lips nor utter any sound whatsoever. He, he talked with you in, in telepathy then. That was right, that his lips did not move. He uttered no words at all. But you talked. I mean, you, he did Yes, I talked. He told me, he told me twice that I could either talk or I could think which either would be better or easier for me. This was an instant thing. This wasn't, there was no hesitation on his part nor on your part. You knew immediately what he was That's communicating correct. to you, and he knew immediately what you were communicating to him. That is right. Mm -hmm. uh, what did this object, what color was this object? This object was between a real dark gray and black. I would call it a charcoal color. It glistened. In my headlights, my headlights, when it stopped me, my headlights were shining directly on it. it uh, were there lights in it? No, I see no lights of any kind. There was no lights in it. There were windows? If there was windows, I couldn't detect them. I couldn't see them. And when the door, now, uh, you, could, you had a very clear view from behind the wheel of your van, uh, uh, the driver's seat of your van. Yes. He came forward toward you, be, did he tell you, did he communicate to you to roll your window down before he got to the side of your truck? Well, was he still in your headlights when he communicated? He was, he was still in my headlights, walking in a, in a kind of a diagonal way across my headlights to the right-hand side of my truck when he told me then to roll down, if I would please roll down the window on the right-hand side of my truck. Uh, now, in the beginning... You were driving south on 77. Correct. From Marietta. Yes. Toward uh, Mineral Wells. Yes. A car passed you. It did. Immediately behind this car, of what distance? I would say between 25 and 30 feet. It was very close to the other car. Uh, it came this object. Yes. Uh, hovering how far off the ground, would you say? Well, when, it, when I first seen it, uh, I... I, I seen it out of the corner of my eye, and I first thought it was just another car, and then I knew it wasn't a car almost immediately, and I turned and looked at it. And I would say it was approximately 30 to 35 feet long, and it came directly across, past my truck, and immediately turned sideways. It was completely across the two-lane highway. It was completely blocked me. I went partly <coughs> off of the road onto the berm to try to go around it, but I couldn't get around it. it now, let me ask you something. Uh, this, then when it came in front of your car, may I have, uh, the, uh, Mr. Dernberger was kind enough to draw us a sketch of what this object appeared to him, uh, and we'll, we'll let you see it here. I'm correct. Okay, me. so I'm going to um, stop the interview the there. Why didn't he start that whole thing with just this guy that communicated with me telepathically? Like, what do I do, basically? He, like, was giving the whole interview as if this was just, like, a normal occurrence, you know? It was crazy to me that he didn't start with, oh, uh, first of all, the first thing you need to understand that's the most important part of this story is someone came out of a UFO and communicated with me telepathically. Right. Their mouth did not move as they shared all this information with me. Right. To me, that's like the most important part of the interview. Right. Well, I think, so at this point, he had already spoken to the police. So yeah. he'd already told his family. He'd already told the police. Um, and then when word kind of got out, the very next day, he went on a television program local to his area to talk about his experience. And so right. I think the whole purpose of this interview was that the 
person interviewing him was saying, okay, like, let's go through this play by play, like what happened to you so that the people at home can understand that you're like a credible, not a crazy person or yeah. And also they can understand like what you're even talking about. Yeah. I mean, sometimes when you go into these formal settings to like give your side of the story, I'm speaking from experience because one time I had to get a restraining order. There's no time to explain. (laughs) But the attorney was like, when you're telling your story, it's easy to get passionate about it. right? Right. Like to like be quick quick, speak quickly and speak casually but you need to maintain like you're cool you need to speak very slowly be like these are the facts yeah taking emotion out of it so that way you are perceived as more credible right for sure so this next photo that is showing up here in the slideshow natalia is a artist rendition of the sketch that oh my gosh okay so yeah so this it shows like a van it looks like mm-hmm. um it was described as a truck but this is like a van to me oh yeah i probably just misspoke yeah it was a van okay a van um and then the ufo that's in front it doesn't look like a ufo i've ever seen before like normally when you mm-hmm. think of a ufo you think of like a disc or like one of those like egg shaped things or like um the torpedo shape or whatever um, but this literally looks like a like a bowling ball, like a not a bowling ball, a bowling pin mm-hmm. on its side or something. Or like, you know what it looks like? One of those things that you roll dough out with sort of a rolling pin. Yeah, it does kind of look like a rolling a rolling pin. pin, but like swollen in the middle rather mm-hmm. than skinny. Right. It, it's weird. It's just not a normal shape for a ufo i've never seen one yeah totally and and i've seen a lot of ufo drawings guys yes (laughs) on this show we've gone through tens of ufo uh, drawings so now unfortunately woody has passed on um and so we can't ask him any of the questions that we may have ourselves right however his daughter is carrying on his legacy of recounting the tale of this man who uh was called himself cold right And I'd like to call her now to see if she can perhaps answer some of our questions, speak from her perspective. She was a child at the time that this happened and just learn some more information in general. You guys heard it here first. We are going to be a totally an original source for now. All these other podcasts and UFO sighting stuff. Right. So her name is Tanya. Okay. And this is incredible. Going okay, to I'm get... practicing what I'm going to say to her. First of all, Tanya, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day right. to talk with us. We are so excited to have you on the podcast. I'm trying to find my... So oh, there it is. Go ahead and just take walk us through what that fateful day in 1966 was like for your father. Right. Are we going to say something like that? Well, hold on. Wait, <laughs> what is this? Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to... I have an app that like records my phone calls. Oh, wow. Okay, call. And then I have to merge the call. Okay, so I have to add the call. Your interview might be recorded for quality control purposes <laughs> on this podcast. Okay, let's see if this. Hi, Tanya. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, Tanya. This is Allie, and I have my co-host, Natalia, here with me. And I just wanted to thank you so much for allowing me to call you and talk to you today. No problem. Great. So we actually just finished listening to your father's original television interview the day after his encounter Mm -hmm. with this entity known as Cold. Um, And I I wanted to ask you, about how old were you when this happened to your father? I was about four. About four. And do you recall any events from this day? Oh, I recall a lot of the events from the day. Well, my brother and I were sitting in the living room watching TV, and dad worked usually evenings and late at night as a salesman and he came home he he didn't ever just come in and say say hello and everything he'd come in and play with me or play games with my brother and I I was always a daddy's girl so he always he never failed to spend time with me when he came in and on this night Dad came in and he walked right past me as if I wasn't there, even though I was standing right by the door where I always am. And he was white as a sheet. And he proceeded into the living room, talk, or into the kitchen to talk to my mom. He uh, sat down at the kitchen table and she started to warm up his dinner. And he said, wait a minute, I need to talk to you about something. And she thought maybe from the look on his face he had hit somebody coming down the highway 
coming home from Marietta, Ohio, and he started to tell her about this encounter. And she told him to stop for a minute because she was afraid he'd scare. She said, Woody, you'll scare the children. So mom sent my brother and I up to bed, and I was never one to just stay in bed. I always wanted to know what was going on. I was always a curious type the one who had to be nosy and find out what was going on. So I snuck back downstairs, and there was this little alcove where I knew I could hide because I had hidden there before. So I hid and listened to my mom and, or my dad tell my mom's story about how he was stopped on the highway by this, by this guy. And dad started to call the police. His mom said, well, you need to report something like that. And dad couldn't hold the phone. So mom actually dialed it and called called the sheriff's department. And after that conversation, I just run upstairs to bed because mom and dad started to get up from the kitchen table. And I ran upstairs to bed until I heard a knock on the door. And I came running back downstairs, down the stairs to see who, who it was. And in walked a sheriff's deputy. And I knew that's who that was because... He was also my mom's cousin at the time. And a policeman and a plainclothes guy who I was later told was in the Air Force and some news people from, from WTAP. And I listened to Dad recount the story to them. And I ran back upstairs before everybody left. And I heard a knock on the door, to which in came three guys dressed in suits, and I just figured they were deacons from the, from the church, but what I thought was weird was they had sunglasses on, and I thought, okay, it's dark outside, but I didn't really think anything of it, and I was only four. I didn't know any better, and I heard this gentleman tell my dad that he was to re- recant his story and not tell anybody else. Well, dad was never the intimidating type, so he just told him, no, I'm not recanting. I'm not telling people that this this didn't happen because it did. And then they left and I went on up to bed. And that was basically that first night. So these three men that came to the door wearing sunglasses, you said? Yeah, I later learned that they were known as what what people now call the men in black. So did they did they introduce themselves or anything? Or did they just come knock on the door and then No, they they just knocked on the door and mom had them come in. And they just said, Hey, you're you need to recant your story right wow and not tell anybody else what's going on do you have any opinion of i know you were four but at the time did your parents think oh these are like people from the police or these are people from the government no and i asked dad about it later on and dad said he really didn't have any thought about who they might be and then so the next day the day after your dad had this encounter that's when he did the television interview right Right. And did that interview kind of, did that affect him or your family in in any way? Yeah, it certainly did because when mom and dad came home, they, uh, there were hundreds of people in our yard, including, I mean, there were men walking around with guns and I didn't, you know, we're in West Virginia. We, we see people, we see people walking around with rifles in the woods all the time. So I never really thought anything about it at the time. Mom and dad came home, and like I said, there were hundreds of people in our yard. In fact, for days, there were there were people coming by, and the sheriff's department would have to come and have everybody leave, and they'd leave, and the sheriff's department would leave, and they'd come back, and oh, wow. Yeah, we even had, I had to start sleeping with my parents because right outside my window, I had a big, huge tree. And there were men in, sitting in guns in the in the tree outside my my window. Oh my gosh! Yeah, with with guns. I guess they were waiting for the quote unquote spacemen to show up. Wow. So were these were just regular citizens that were sitting in the tree, or were these people from the police department, or? Well, they were just they were just regular citizens who had seen Dad's interview on TV. So how did how did your mom react to to this information? Well. Mom was okay with it at first. When people start, when we, we had to move several times and we'd have an endless phone number and an endless address, but people would still find us somehow and call, and call at all hours of the, uh, of the day and the night. Mom had finally just had enough. 
So it eventually broke up my parents' marriage. A group from Cleveland, from a group called the Cleveland Ufology Project came down. And I guess one of the guys charmed my mother and told her he could take her away from all of that and took us back to Cleveland with it, with him. And that was basically the end of my parents' marriage. One of the things that we ended on with the interview that we were listening to is that the entity cold said, we will see you again. Mm -hmm. Um, right. and, and I was wondering, did did that come to fruition? Oh, yeah. Indrid Cold and Carl Arzo and Fimo Hassan, they would come by very often and sit in the back on the back porch of dad, usually late at night once things kind of died down a little bit. So this was when your when your parents were still together? Yeah, my parents were still together. and They would come by and one time they brought their kids with them. So, okay, so let Wait. me back up. So, Indrid Cold, the original entity that your dad had seen on the freeway, came back right. with two other entities. Did they look similar? Yes, they all looked similar. They were very canned, which I couldn't understand because we lived in West Virginia and it was November. But they were very canned and very tall. But they just looked like regular, they just looked like regular people. I mean, dad even later on said that Kindred Cold and Demo's son and Carl Ardo were even amongst the crowd that night. Oh. The day after he, the day after he went on TV. One time they brought their, Indrid brought his two sons and Demo's son brought his daughter. And my brother was in school. We went upstairs to his room to play with cars. And I brought guns, which scared the heck out of him because I guess Lanulus was known as a peaceful planet. They didn't have guns to play with and they had never. They had never had guns and kind of scared them, so I had to put them away real fast. Did the children say, like, what the name of their school was or, or what grade they well, were they in? Didn't, they didn't really give a name of a school. They were older than I was, of course, so. So the children told you they were from another planet? Well, I don't know if they really knew they were from another planet. I don't remember the complete conversations between, between us. Mm -hmm. All I know is I had new friends to play with. I even had got old boxes out because dad would bring home old boxes from sewing machines and TVs and stereos and stuff that he would deliver. And we were, we were sliding down the stairs one day in him and one night that night in him. And of course I got in trouble. You heard Tanya, Tanya Deneen Derenberger. And when a mom, <laughs> when mom uses your middle name, you know, you're really in trouble. Right. I can definitely relate to that. Oh. Yeah. So, so we took the boxes outside, and it had rained. It, there wasn't any snow outside, but we took boxes outside, and we were sliding down the hill in the mud in them and having a good time. So when when Indrid Cold came back to your house, did your dad say to him, or I don't know if you would know the answer to this, but did your dad try to get him to go to the police with him as like sort of like a proof, like, hey, this is the entity that I saw? I don't believe so. And dad never really said, and I never thought to ask that question. So in Indrid never went, um, for example, like never returned to the TV studio or anything like that with your dad? Oh, no, he wanted, he wanted people to know that they were there. But he didn't want anybody to know who they were. They were very fearful of our government. And so they were afraid of, of getting caught by our government. And they still are. So wait, so they still are. So have you talked to him since your dad's passing? Or have you talked to him in like recent years? Oh, yeah, I've had quite a bit of contact with Andrew Cold over the years. Could you could you go into some stories of encounters you've had with him? My favorite one is when I was a little girl, actually. My mom and I were at a local... I don't know if you're old enough to remember the old Woolworths where they had the lunch counters. We were at a local drugstore that was like that. And mom gave me some money to go get some ice cream while she, she shopped. Because back then you didn't have to worry about anybody snatching your kid. And I was sitting at the lunch counter waiting for the waitress. And she brought over this big old huge ice cream sundae and sat it in front of me. And of course I was always taught never to take candy or anything from strangers. And I asked the waitress where that came from because I hadn't ordered yet and she said it's from the gentleman down the down the other side of the counter and I looked down and there sat there sat Andrew Cole. He simply grabbed, had her 
take my ice cream down there, went down, sat next to him. Of course, I was always told I was never to use his name in public. I simply went down and thanked him and sat there and ate my fill of ice cream. And then did your mom come back and see that you were sitting there with injured cold? Well, I got up at that point and went looking for my mom after I finished the ice cream so I could tell mom. And what was strange is every time mom would go shopping, even that time, she wouldn't even get out of the car and dad would come to the car and tell her what she bought, who she talked to, how much money she spent and everything. He had already known somehow. So she, your mom would go on a shopping trip and then come back. And before she would even get out of the car, your your father would come up to her and say, hey, I know that you bought X, Y, and Z yeah. and you spent this amount yeah. of money. Yeah. And who she, who she talked to. Did your mom ever ask, how do you know this information? I don't know. Mom didn't get quite that far in our conversation. I got that information from my mother on her deathbed. Oh, my wow. mother, my mother for years denied the story because she didn't want to be associated with it any longer. And when my mom was was dying in 2009, I, she finally opened up to me about it, oh, wow. and that's one of the stories that she told me. Did your since since this was. It sounds like very painful for for your mother to experience. Did she ever say to you at any point, hey, I, for example, like, hey, I don't believe your father or, hey, um, I think it's this or that? No, she never out and out told me that she didn't believe it or she didn't believe him. It was just a very, it wasn't a pretty divorce from what I understand because of the situation and Dad had already had another girlfriend, apparently. So there was a lot. I mean, there was more involved than just a UFO thing, but most of it was was the UFO thing. I read a couple of, like, skeptical articles, and some people, for example, think that maybe your father fell asleep while he was driving that day and then dreamed this encounter with Indrid. But it sounds like you physically met this entity, so that theory kind of isn't possible. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Dad, dad never fell asleep on the driving on the road right. that I know of. And I mean, dad was always up until late anyway, doing paperwork for his, you know, his sales. And the entity didn't seem evil or like bad? No. Oh, no, never. He was always very nice to me and very sweet and still is when I... When I do see him out in public. does So when you see him now, because we're talking about this original encounter happened in 1966. When you see him right. now, does he appear as an aged older man or does he appear in the same form as when you saw him in 1966? Oh, no, he appears an aged older man. I mean, he's like 95 years old now. Oh, wow. But the lifespan, I guess, on Lanyo is, is anywhere between 125 and 175 years old. So what can you can you restate the name of the planet? Annulus. And have did your dad ever get to visit this planet or did you have you ever been to visit this planet? I've never been up on one of in, in one of Indra's spaceships, so no. But dad dad back in the nineteen eighties really wouldn't talk to anybody about it. And I know in, in his book he you know, he says he blew up the Lanulus and a lot of things happened, and he recounted that story, those, some of those stories to me back in the 80s. So do you know about how many times your father went with Indrid and the spaceship to Lanulos? Oh, no, I don't recall. I mean, Dad would even have pieces of missing time. Dad would be gone sometimes for weeks on end and come back and not even know where he had been. And I, I had also read kind of in that same vein, I had also read that after your dad went public with his story, the government or a government official or somebody from the government invited him to participate in a bunch of psychiatric tests in order to verify whether or not the story could have been like an epileptic event or something like that. Is that is that correct? Yes. And dad told him, well, if you take them, I'll take them too. Dad finally did go to a doctor and have, you know, an EEG and an EKG and all those other tests. And he was found to be perfectly, you know, perfectly sane and 
no health issues. And so speaking of health issues, I know I've we've gone over so many stories of people that had that have had contact with UFOs um, just throughout different episodes we've had. And it seems like there are some people who start to have so, sort of start to be like plagued by illness following an, an encounter. So I was kind of wondering, did your dad, who was in perfectly good health, did anything ever happen to him health wise after this initial encounter? No, dad always was in good health up until the day he passed away from a heart attack in 1990. Um, Natalia, do you have any more questions? No, I'm I I was very interested in finding out whether Indrid cold was a negative force because some people have described the entity as being frightful, but it sounds like he's, you know, or they or whatever it is 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 just interested in like normal family life. Yeah, he'd like to see us be a pe- like to see us be a peaceful planet, but mm-hmm. and I guess until that happens He's not going to, well, they are not going to show themselves to us. I know I did have talked to Indrid about several things, that different things that have happened in the past, but that's in my next book. I do have a book out now called Beyond Lanulus, which entails all my encounters with Indrid. And I urge you to get a copy through me because if you buy it on Amazon, I don't make any money. Feel free to message me on Facebook. If you get it through me, it comes autographed. Ooh, we'll have to read that. Yeah, wow. I'll definitely put those links in the show notes for this episode. I do have a couple a couple questions that I just thought of. Did did Indrid ever say what his purpose was here on Earth? Not really. He he described himself to dad as a searcher and I even asked him what he was searching for. And he said he was just searching for to see what different planets had the same technology as they did. Actually, he was looking for someone from Earth to join what they call the Intergalactic Council. And while they didn't find that a useful communicant for that, um, I don't, according to Indrid, they never have found anybody from Earth uh, suitable for that, that position. The Intergalactic Council, did he explain what that is? Well, he explained it to Dad, and Dad explained it to me, that it was different beings from different planets, I guess, form one council to hopefully make the world a peaceful place. I'm trying to think skeptically so that we can have um, like a full rounded discussion. Did he ever ask for money or, or did he ever want anything from you guys or was he truly just no. there for companionship? And No, he was there here for companionship and he always told me ever since I was a little girl and he still tells me that as long as he's around and his sons are around, that no physical harm will ever come to me. I told him, I said, so you were sent to be my guardian angel. He said, well, I guess you could say that. Do you have, over the years, have you ever been able to get a photograph with him? No, he won't allow any pictures to be taken. But I always tell people that as I got older, he always reminded me of George Hamilton. Do you have any um, abilities or experience to see other supernatural or paranormal phenomena? I'm just trying to figure out why Indrid Cole chose your family or you to maintain this relationship with. I don't really know. I guess he just found us to be very receptive and he found my dad to be a good communicant. Just for the record, your father never had any history of, of mental illness or a condition like epilepsy or um, hallucinations. No, nothing. In fact, my dad never even really watched science fiction shows on TV. He really didn't have time for anything like that. Some people have said that maybe this Indrid Cold was, was a friend of your father's and for whatever reason he didn't want your mom to know like, hey, this is my friend. So he made up a, a story. What would you say in response to that? No, that's that's totally false. Mm-hmm. Mom knew all of dad's friends and dad would never have done that to mom, especially. I mean, he loved my mother very much and my brother and I. Mm-hmm. And so especially near the end of their marriage, he he never would have done that if he thought he was losing my mom and my brother and I. I mean, Right. There were several years in there where my father and I even lost touch when I was a teenager, and he never would have done something like that. When we moved to Cleveland, it was it was a very short time before Dad moved up to Cleveland also. 
to try and get away from all from everything and to be be closer to my well mostly me and i've i also read a theory that said that your father could have been hired by the government to create this um like false narrative that would then draw people's attention to it and so they would ignore other things the government was up to at the time do you have a response to that as well yeah if they were true we wouldn't have been poor dad lost his job as a salesman and was unemployed for for quite a while because of all of this we would we would have had more money if that were the case natalia do you have any more questions for tanya <sighs> one question is not enough or no one question is not enough a thousand questions isn't enough i mean th this is this is so interesting to me. I, I yeah, I, I guess I'm just really interested in what the motive for Indrid would be to come to our planet. But that's coming from my sort of like human perspective, because everything on Earth is like y y we have to calculate in how much money travel would cost like to go intergalactically would be so expensive that I that I just feel like there would have to be some really strong motive. But that's not to say that, you know, and from this Lanulos planet, the people there just have access to travel or perhaps injured cold was just way smarter than everyone else there. Or it's like, you know, a Jeff Bezos situation where he just like goes to Earth for fun. I don't know. I don't know. I never thought to ask him that question. But I mean, he was he was a very smart person. Mm -hmm. And on Lanulos, they go to school for a very long time. It would be like equal to our graduating high school and then going to college. So they're all very well educated. Well, do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like our audience to hear about? Is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to make sure gets out there to the public? Nothing I can really think of. Just I'd like everybody to keep an open mind. And, you know, if you want more information, buy my book. Feel free to friend me on Facebook. I'm, I'm always open to ask, you know, to answering anybody's questions. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Thank Tanya. You. This was mm -hmm. so interesting, and I really appreciate you making time to come on our show today. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. All right. Natalia, that is wild. Yeah. F fuck, man. I mean, I'm just going to say what everyone's thinking. Do we believe this woman? Yes, right? I mean, it sounds like because these are I'm trying to think skeptically about right. like, you know, stuff I've read online and stuff that comes to my mind. If he never if this injured cold never received any money. Right. And she didn't their family didn't receive any money. It sounds no. like her book's not making her like a millionaire. She's selling it yeah, she to said random she, people on Facebook. And she said on Amazon she doesn't even get yeah. any money from it. So it I, tore up her family's marriage. It sounds like it's had a negative effect in a right. lot more ways than a positive effect. Yeah. So I think I don't know. It's very interesting, especially with the knowledge that her mother knew about this entity, mm -hmm. you know, like met this entity and then was like, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. So it's not like I guess here's my thing. If we're going through skeptic um, arguments, right. I think the most the top of the list would probably be it's a hallucination or something, uh -huh. right? But the problem is if other people can see your hallucination, then it's right. no longer a hallucination. Yeah. So I think we can eliminate that. So then that brings us to the next level of, okay, so if Indrid Cold is a real person mm -hmm. who stopped her dad on the highway one day right, and then came and started, you know, befriending every one of the family, I think then the only explanation that makes sense is the last one I asked her about, which is could this have been a a special friend of yeah. your dad that he was he didn't want your mom to know about right like he's because like, this is the 60s yeah he's like this isn't my gay you know roommate side piece. or whatever yeah this is uh, an alien from milanulos and right. these are not my love children that i had out of well i guess two guys can't have babies can they well you can adopt I yeah suppose. okay yeah. these are not my two adopted, adopted children right these are like extraterrestrials right but then which I, is honestly a fucking if you can get someone to believe that then well i feel like it's, please write to us on the show right but i but then her response to that is no because he ended up losing not only his wife but right. his kids yeah so would someone keep up that charade knowing the pain of not being able to see your children and furthermore would someone keep up that charade mm -hmm. by going on national television 
the next day after your tryst with your boyfriend. Yeah. I don't see why someone would do that because he didn't have to go on TV. Yeah. I could see maybe if you're a super skeptic and you're like, well, he comes home, he tells this crazy story to his wife. His wife's like, well, if that really happened to you, then call the police. Yeah. You know, so I could see him being like, oh, OK, right, all like, right. I'm going to call your bluff. Right. And yeah. then he actually does it. But there was no reason for him to go on TV. OK, from a skeptic point of view, too, which I never take the skeptic side, but this story requires it. I feel like in order for me to fully believe, I need to play like a double All the advocate. scenarios yes. through your head. Yes. Totally So if him and his wife were in a marriage that's kind of falling apart, sounds like may perhaps there was some infidelity. Maybe he had a girlfriend shortly after or like, you know, there. if your or marriage- Or the mom is, had that, had a boyfriend. If your yeah. marriage isn't going well, then, you know, there's the other- partner could be thinking of all of these scenarios like he's cheating on me or whatever so what if he was like late for work a skeptic scenario here uh he went and like was up to something he shouldn't be doing i don't know what he was doing maybe he was sleeping with someone else whatever and then he comes home and the wife and and he's like fuck oh my god i was just gone for way too long my wife's gonna be pissed what should i do and then he's right. like fuck it i'm just gonna like really maintain this story and he until comes the home, day he dies until the though? day yeah and you know, i'm gonna write a book like i'm just gonna keep doubling down on it right but that's the part that doesn't make sense is if him and the wife both believed this you know up and until the on the deathbed yeah then it doesn't make sense right right no i agree and especially because i first of all i completely understand that an event that would that tears apart your family and your right. marriage, you're not going to want to talk about that. So I find that totally believable yes. that the, that um, Tanya's mother didn't ever want to talk about it with her children. Right. That sounds like it would be very painful, whatever the situation is. Right. If it's an alien, if it's a special friend, if it's a lover, if it's yeah. whomever, that would be very painful. Yes. But on your deathbed mm -hmm. to then be taught saying, hey, it's real. Yeah. It happened. And like, here's, you know, some more information about it. I mean, why not on your deathbed be like, hey, I've, your dad was cheating on me. Right. Why? Or just not say anything. If you don't mm -hmm. want to cause pain to your child, then you, sh you would just not say anything and you would never acknowledge it again. So the fact that her mother brought it up on her deathbed to me somehow makes it more yeah, incredible. No, it, it definitely does. Yeah. This is one of those that's like hard to believe because of how out there it is. Yeah. But I choose to believe it. And so now I'm going to say next, my biggest question is why? Like, why did Indrid Cold come here? But like I was saying before, I mean, why the fuck did Jeff Bezos go to space for right, fun? Right. You know? Yeah. Well, and she said that he described himself as an explorer. So if we think of maybe like maybe something equivalent, I don't know. I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Like, yeah. OK, we there are areas of the ocean that are unexplored. Like we talked about right. in our Ningen episode yeah. two episodes ago. So why, what is the point of us continuing to try to explore those areas when there's nothing for us there? Right. Be in the name of exploration, simply. So could he not just be an explorer that wants to experience, wants to see what's out there? I mean, if we were to go to another society or whatever right. and, you know, make ourselves visible to some aliens we made friends with or whatever, then absolutely I would want to continue to go and look at them and see how their life was going because it's probably so different than ours. Right. Like he's at this drugstore being like, wow, l l this is how the humans eat and they order yeah. this stuff and I'm going to get this little girl an ice cream and watch her eat it because, it, you know, it's, it's just so interesting. Just like if you have a pet, like I get my dog a new treat and I'm watching him because it's like fascinating to see yeah. what he's doing with this gift <laughs> right. I gave him. Yeah, you know? totally. Or even just like now I have a niece because my um, sister-in-law gave yeah. birth and buying her stuff is so rewarding amazing yeah. yeah even though she like is not she's like 15 days old she's yeah. like not ready to be excited but it, but no. I'm like oh my god here's another gift another gift yeah. another gift because it's just like oh my god there's this little thing that like I don't know and then maybe that's something beautiful that like love permeates this entire universe right, right? like there's this I interest and this willingness to you know see other species and mm -hmm. communicate with them with love and that makes sense with what she was saying too is that they're kind of apprehensive with earth because we can't even fucking love our neighbors and we literally all evolved from the same shit we're yeah. the same people and we're like oh, let's build borders here. Let's kill each other because we can't fucking agree. And that's right. like not even intergalactic. That's like people a couple kilometers over. Mm -hmm. No, I, yeah, I definitely think that that 
is a valid point. Yeah. I mean, if I were, yeah, if I were from a peaceful society and then I come to this like batshit crazy pandemic war torn, right. uh, like situation where everyone hates each other. Right. Like she was saying, you know, he saw the, what we do to illegal aliens and was like, mm, I'm good. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. He's like, oh, okay. Guantanamo Bay. Right. Like, um, no, thanks. No, thanks. Yeah. I don't want to be like vivisected or, you know, like if we believe in right. the Roswell incident, which we haven't done a full episode on yet. So if you guys don't know about the Roswell incident, there's no time to explain. But also we haven't talked about it yet. Mm -hmm. um, in one of those theories, aliens crash landed and then were vivisected, which means you're alive and you right. have an autopsy performed on you to see how everything works. Maybe he's looking at that example and saying, mm -hmm. well, why would I want to put myself right. in that position? Right. And it's funny because it, it like, you know how they say you see perceive the world through your eyes. Like how I was saying earlier, I would be afraid of aliens because right. we just think they're going to probe us and they're going to vivisect us and all of that. But in reality, that's what we would do to them. Right. No, that's a great point. And then injured cold comes over and, and he's, he's like, like, here's a normal some guy. Yeah. Yeah. Here's and an ice cream sundae. Yeah, I know. That's very, very interesting. Well, um, in the interest of time, I am going to just plow through the last part of this episode. Okay. So although Woody, who is Tanya's father, Woodrow, mm -hmm. was the only person brave enough to give a live television interview about his run in with the being who referred to himself as cold or injured cold. Yeah. There were other witnesses on the road that night. And according to an article published to historicmysteries.com, author Les Hewitt writes, quote, on the very same night, on the very same road, two other men saw an elongated object land in front of their vehicle. They were also forced to stop, and they watched as a man disembarked and headed their way. He wore a dark coat and folded both arms in such a way that it could be considered uncomfortable. He asked both men questions that seemed pointless to them before the man returned to his craft and subsequently took off. We know that these encounters did take place because both reports were allegedly given to the Parkersburg police. Mm -hmm. A few years after Woody's incident, investigative paranormal author John Keel, who we may remember as being the author of the Mothman prophecies, right. he tracked down these two men who wished to remain anonymous. Quote, we don't want to get involved, one of them said flatly. So it sounds like Indrid Cold is zipping around above this freeway, landing, talks to someone, is like, this isn't the right person to contact. Right. Goes back up, lands, talks to someone, no, this person's not right either. And then who knows how many times he did that and then settled upon right. Tanya's father, Woody. Yeah. So that's... I mean, it sounds like other witnesses came forward. Of course, skeptics say, well, there's no way to corroborate this. We can't prove that these people existed if they remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. That's technically true. Yeah. But I did want to point out that allegedly there are more witnesses besides Woody. Uh, and the third and final sighting of the smiling man actually comes from Point Pleasant, New Jersey in 1967. Oh, right. And regular listeners of where our Mothman show. Mothman lives. Yes. May remember that Point Pleasant is the location where the Mothman was first sighted. And Mothman was sighted between... November 15th to December 15th of 1966, the same year we're talking about. Yeah, Mothman was like definitely, you know, he was doing he knew it up. Injured Cold was going to be there. He may have. I'm just saying it's coincidental that they were there at the same time, or is it? It's not. Yeah. Less than a year after the Mothman sightings took Point Pleasant by storm, the Lily family experienced a series of terrifying, unexplained events in their rural farmhouse. It all began when bright, diamond-shaped lights started flitting around their farmhouse at night. Over time, the lilies were able to make out the outline of aircrafts around the diamond-shaped lights, leading them to believe that the light was emanating from the windows of these crafts. While paranormal investigative journalist John Keel was looking into Mothman, he stumbled upon the lily reports. Unsure if they could be related to Mothman or not, he decided to go ahead and pay them a visit. According to an interview given to Keel by Mrs. Lilly, she claims that it all began in the fall of 1966 when they started hearing, quote, odd noises around their little ranch. They didn't know what to make of the noises, but as they continued and grew louder and more intense, the Lilies became concerned that their home might be haunted. <laughs> quote, kitchen cabinet doors slammed in the middle of the night and noises that sounded like a baby crying no. suddenly began with no warning. This is why I don't fuck with rural farmhouses. No, this is why I don't fuck with babies. Quote, <laughs> it sounded so plain, Mrs. Lilly told Keel, that I looked around the house even though I knew there was no baby there. It seemed to be coming from the living room, only a few feet away from me. Then the aforementioned silent crafts with diamond-shaped windows began appearing. 
Quote, we've seen all kinds of strange things, Mrs. Lilly continued. Blue lights, green ones, red ones, things that change color. Some have been so low that we thought we could see these diamond-shaped windows mm -hmm. in them, and none of them make any noise at all. They fly completely silently. Mm -hmm. Keel would go on to write in his book, The Complete Guide to Mysterious Beings, that the Lilly family's daughter-in-law, Doris Lilly, who also lived in Point Pleasant, would start re receiving strange phone calls in 1967. Quote, each evening around 5 p.m., her phone would ring, and when she answered, she heard only a bizarre metallic voice speaking in an incomprehensible language. It was guttural and rapid. These calls only came when she was alone. Mm. It was as if something new when I was home by myself, <gasps> Doris said. When Keel asked the Lilies if they had ever seen a man along with these strange noises and UFO sightings, the Lily's 16-year-old daughter, Linda, reluctantly told the following story to him. In March of 1967, Linda woke up one night with a large figure towering over her bed. It was a man, she said, a big man, very broad. I couldn't see his face very well, but I could see that he was grinning at me. According to her mother, Linda then began screaming. When Mrs. Lilly rushed into her daughter's bedroom, she saw Linda sitting upright in her bed, clutching her face in horror. When Mrs. Lilly told her that there was no one in the room, Linda just kept screaming that there was a man smiling at her oh. at the foot of her bed. Oh, my God. Linda described the man as wearing a, quote, shiny checkered shirt, being over six feet tall and smiling an impossibly large smile. Unbeknownst to the Lilies, another family called the Glines had seen a man identical to this one, but they had seen him four years earlier in Florida during a hurricane. George Glines, the patriarch of the family, was lying on the couch in his dimly lit living room one night when he suddenly got the prickling, uneasy feeling that someone was watching him. Mm. When he looked up, he saw a tall, broad man measuring over six feet tall in a plaid sports shirt smiling at him. George sprang to his feet. The man took one step back into the shadows of the room and then disappeared. The Glynde's son-in-law, James Boone, reportedly saw this same man in his own bedroom a few days later. The man was standing at the foot of his bed as he had done to Linda Lilly. In the years since the 1960s and 70s, there have only been a couple of smiling man sightings. Right. The most recent sighting, as far as we can tell, the last, so the most recent sighting, and as far as we can tell, the last, came in April of 2009 when a blogger named H.R. Zapruder posted the following possible smiling man encounter he had near Roswell, New Mexico. Quote, soon afterwards, I drove past a man standing in the brush. I thought he was hitchhiking, so I sped past. You know, hitchhikers equals bad news. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't think much of it at first, but as I sped by, I noticed a green glistening so I inspected the rearview mirror. I saw the man from behind. He was bald, over six feet tall, and wearing a sparkling green jacket. The rest was obscured by the brush. When I arrived in town, I was told by some locals that I'd just missed a UFO. <gasps> so now, let's get into the theories for this week's episode, Natalia. So the next slide... This is an illustration of Indrid Cold standing in front of yeah, the I mean, car. Yeah, I mean, it's like a serial killer that will gut you from taint to but, bottom but instead, lip. Right, but instead he buys Sundays for I know, that's girls. what I can't figure out is like, why do, are some people so afraid from him, of him and other people describe him as being really sweet? But then maybe it goes back to what I was thinking of, like, we're projecting our fears onto it, right. you know? Right. No, I. You're like this smiling man freaked me the fuck out. Right. He was man. smiling too big. Also, it's just so creepy to think of someone you don't know just staring at you smiling. Like, right. whereas they might think smiling is a happy gesture right. for humans. Uh, I'm wrong. Smile. We're a complicated species. That's right. We'll kill you for looking at us too long. That is a hundred percent accurate. So the next slide shows our first theory, mm -hmm. which is a hoax. So proponents of this theory claim that the various sightings of smiling men, weird looking men and UFOs are completely unconnected from each other and can be explained a bit away by one or a combination of the following explanations. Get ready. Sleep paralysis. Hallucinations. No. Nightmares. No. Daydreams. Optical illusions and mental illness. Well, guess what? I say all of those are proof that there's hauntings like you're saying sleep paralysis and mental illness 
prove that there's no supernatural stuff. And I'm like, those actually do the opposite for me. That's very, you're right. Thank you for grouping all the things that (laughs) prove there are entities beyond our understanding. Love it. Well, I think we can move on to theory number two then. Yes. Theory number two, an intergalactic police force. All right. This one comes from mysteriousuniverse.org's article from 2011 titled The Grinning Man, Alien Apparition or MIB? The article states, Indrid Cold in particular and grinning men in general may be delegates of a sort of paranormal or possibly intergalactic police force that spontaneously appear in the area of anomalous events in order to keep the peace or simply to observe the proceedings as they unfold. Mm. Additionally, most of the witnesses originate from Keel's book that I was citing throughout this episode, and some journalists have claimed that since he has had so many anonymous sources, it's impossible to vet the validity of these stories he tells, and therefore we don't know if he could just be making everything up. Mm-hmm. Counterpoint, I spoke to the son of Jimmy Yanchitis, and we both spoke to the daughter of Woodrow Derenberger, and they both believe that their parents were telling the truth right. and not perpetuating a hoax. Additionally, none of the people we talked about in this episode, except for maybe the paranormal journalist John Keel, mm-hmm. had anything to gain by publicizing their stories. It's not like they became rich, famous, or relevant. True. In fact, many of them suffered mysterious illnesses, got mm-hmm. divorces, and or lived in fear or isolation. So... That probably should have been moved to theory number one, the hoax, that little part, counterpoint. But intergalactic police force, remember 1966, strange shit is happening all over the place. We just listed so many UFO sightings. Right. Mothman, Grinning Man. I just want to say, like, like, can we normalize giving anonymous testimony because people who do give a testimony that's not anonymous, we think they're crazy? Yeah. So, like, why would you not? It's almost more crazy to give it not anonymously. That's a great point. Yeah. I mean, if I saw something insane and yeah. then I went on television and then my whole life was ruined. Right. Like then probably the next person who's witnessing that happen to me is going to be like, well, I saw the same thing, but please don't tell anyone who I am. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think of an intergalactic police force? Because it seems like. I mean, it's trigger. The name is triggering. I don't like hearing about the police or right. force. Right. We like, but this is like a gentle being yeah. if we think injured cold is part of this. So yeah. maybe it says on here, maybe they're either there to keep the peace or to just simply observe and report back what they're seeing. Right. So maybe they knew, okay, this crazy fucking mothman's going to show up. We got to like yeah. send all of our best people. Oh, right. People. Like they were there to combat another force that we don't even understand. Right. They were there to keep us from getting our whole ass eaten by right. a mothman. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some people would pay good money for that yeah, right. so maybe they didn't do us a favor so theory number three alien slash extraterrestrial oh, well, duh. this theory states that perhaps the reason for the slight differences in appearance between the smiling men witnessed by people throughout the u.s mm-hmm. may be due to the fact that this is an alien race of smiling men yeah. who just like all humans all appear slightly different right or The aliens could be shape-shifting into what they perceive to be a human form, Mm -hmm. but make slight mistakes resulting in this uncanny Uncanny valley valley effect where the face is human-like but still not quite human. Right. Point for this theory, there were so many UFO sightings in 66 and 67 in West Virginia, New Jersey, and the surrounding areas. There were honestly way too many incidents for me to list for mm-hmm. in just one episode, and nearly all of them happened near bodies of water, involved bright lights or red lights, silent crafts that hovered without making a noise, and then weird entities that appeared human-like showing up afterwards. A point for this theory of them trying to mimic like human features and not being able to do it. Think about how hard it is to look normal on a camera. Like when someone takes a hard. picture, Holy if you shit. are like angled one one centimeter to the wrong side, like you have a huge forehead and your right. eyes are different sizes and right. you're, you know what I mean? Oh, a straight on <laughs> photo? Absolutely not. I will never allow it. <laughs> yeah. So if you're, that's true. So if you're, okay, again, what if you're an alien and you're looking at photos of humans and some of them are really bad photos yeah and you're like oh let me make the whole left side of my face a little bit lower (laughs) than the right side of my face well this person's ears are hidden by hair they must just not have ears i'll show up with no ears right and these people are all smiling so that's what i'm gonna do right exactly just blend okay next theory theory number four men in black this one also comes from MysteriousUniverse.org's article from 2011 mm-hmm. titled The Grinning Man, Alien Apparition, or MIB. The article states, another hypothesis speculated that, 
speculates that Cold might have been a representative of the notoriously secretive group known as the Men in Black, mm. many of which were allegedly encountered throughout the region during the Mothman craze of the 60s. Right. And if you don't know who the Men in Black are, there's no time to explain. Listen we have to episode. Yep. Episode 19. It's an excellent episode. Mm-hmm. It's like two hours long. We talk super in depth about the Men yeah. in Black. Counterpoint, none of the outfits described in this episode match the Men in Black outfit. Right. That's true. And yeah. she, and Tanya, I mean, if we believe her story, yeah. she She's saw just, three men in black and they did not look like Indrid. They yeah. were coming to say, fucking D- delete, delete your story. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't think it's the men in black. Yeah. I don't want to spoiler alert. I don't think it's the men in black. Right. Yeah. OK. Theory number five. Since all of these UFOs and smiling men sightings came from the same time period as the Mothman, some think that the two are related. Mm -hmm. If we believe the entity is an alien, then perhaps the alien shapeshifts into both the form of the Mothman and the form of the smiling man. Right. Alternatively, if we believe that the Mothman is its own form of cryptid, then perhaps the smiling man is also his own form of cryptid. They both feature human-like features mm-hmm. but are not quite human enough to be called human yeah that one's like mush sheep to me because it's hard to say whether or not cryptids are aliens or aliens are cryptids yeah like it, are they one in the same you know yeah yeah also grasshoppers are aliens as far as i'm concerned the praying mantis alien yeah. okay next theory ghost or poltergeist so remember that the lily family had strange haunting like occurrences <sighs> that accompanied their smiling man the sighting. baby crying Could this perhaps be indicative of the smiling man being a poltergeist or apparition of some sort? We don't usually hear stories of aliens causing cabinets to open and close or the disembodied voice of a crying baby to Mm -hmm. materialize. Counterpoint, what kind of ghost travels across a bunch of different states? Usually, a ghost haunts one particular location or object or only manifests when it's called through a ritual. That's true. But maybe the ritual is driving down a road like the 11 mile road game. Well, shit. If you guys don't know what we're talking about, no time to explain. Go listen to Paranormal Games Part 1. Yeah, maybe like we were, everyone's doing a ritual without even realizing it. And then the alien gets called down and realizes like, oh, these people ain't shit. And then just goes back And then leaves back. Yeah, Yeah. could be. Theory number seven, a psychological experiment. This theory (laughs) alleges that all of the strange (laughs) happenings in the 60s can actually be linked back to one thing. The U.S. government. Yeah, I wouldn't put it past them, honestly. And why would the U.S. government do something so fucking weird, Natalia? MK Ultra. If they were trying to cover something up or distract the public from something else that was going right, on. Right, distracting the psychic eye. Right. If you guys don't know what we're talking about, no time to explain. Go listen to <laughs> Randonautica. We're getting to the point where we can't explain why we can't explain it Right, anymore. yes. We don't have time. And a lot of people online believe this theory. In fact, the YouTube video I played for you with the television interview of mm-hmm. Woody... There's a comment on there by a user named A Sharp who said the following. I honestly feel Darren Berger was paid to make that story up by, quote, black project officials to probably cover something up or to create a myth to describe the experimental aircraft being tested at that time by the U.S. Air Force. But she said it. Then why isn't my family rich? Exactly. Unless he hid the money. But then why did he die poor to her point? Like you have to do something with that money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Theory number seven. Or eight, nine? I don't know. Not eight. Mass hysteria. More like ass hysteria. That's right. Uh, big ass hysteria. And I didn't even put any notes for this one <laughs> because, because it sucks. fuck you. If you don't know what mass hysteria <laughs> is, go listen to the dancing plague episode. It's bullshit. Okay. <laughs> Next theory. Final theory. An ultra terrestrial being. What is that? An oh, ultra terrestrial. Oh, I'm so glad it's that more, you asked. It's more extra than an extra terrestrial. Yes. So, like, anytime you're being extra in the future, if you're being ultra extra, you're just being ultra. Ultra. Wow. Yes. <sighs> Goals. Unlike an extra terrestrial, which is a being thought to originate from within our same solar system, an ultra terrestrial is thought to be a being from another dimension, universe. Or reality. Oh, wow. I love this term now. It's beautiful. I'd never heard of it before either. Yeah, this is perfect. According to an article entitled The Difference Between Extraterrestrials and Ultraterrestrials by M. Admin published to (laughs) KnowledgeNuts.com, quote, (laughs) quote, this hypothesis suggests that rather than originating from from other star systems within our universe, UFOs are craft or phenomena originating from some form of elsewhere, Mm. such as another dimension, universe, or reality. 
This theory would allow the UFO phenomenon and its various incarnations and seeming contradictions to be addressed in a holistic manner. It also suggests that UFOs are so difficult for us to get a grip on simply because they come from somewhere beyond the realm of mm -hmm. modern human understanding. Right. The theory also helps explain other related aspects of UFO lore, such as the supposed men in black who are linked to mysterious or demonic or devilish figures in black reported in legend and folklore. Mm -hmm. While the model for extraterrestrial intelligence seems to assume that they are explorers or invaders of some kind, the ultra-terrestrial hypothesis leads itself to a different speculation. UFO researchers John Keel and Jacques Vallée suggest that there was a, quote, control system created by ultra-terrestrial beings, which has power over our three-dimensional reality and the human perception of it, a role some have called a custodian role. Others see extra-dimensional extra rats, which are able to hide from us due to the relatively narrow range of perception of the electromagnetic <laughs> spectrum, or they could be cosmic tricksters, creatures from different realities that our ancestors once perceived as magical little people oh, lurking wow. in the forest, or burning chariots, or winged angels mm. in the sky. Yeah, that's the ancient aliens yes. theory. Yeah. Yeah. So this one... It, basically just says look i don't understand half of what i just read to you but i think right. the gist of it is that if they come from another realm outside of our understanding we can't even perceive we can't them. even perceive it so right. like we see them and we're like that's a man in right. a green suit like if there was a 2d individual that came into this room we wouldn't be able to see it because we see in 3d right or we would be like is that a line like yeah. a floating line right yeah like how we couldn't we can't even understand yeah so those are all of the theories, the nine theories for this episode, Natalia. Let me go to our last slide, which is our sources, before I ask for your opinion. Sources for this episode are Indrid Cole article posted in cryptids.fandom.com, Indrid Cold Grinning Man of the 1960s American Folklore by Les Hewitt posted to historicmysteries.com, The Complete Guide to Mysterious Beings by John A. Keel, Did a UFO Fly Over West Milford in 1966 by Ann Ganader published to northjersey.com, Weird New Jersey, UFOs over Wanake in 66 by Weird New Jersey, published to the <laughs> Courier Post. Who is the Grinning Man by Brian Dunning for Skeptoid.com. The Grinning Man, Alien Apparition or MIB by Author Not Listed for MysteriousUniverse.org. Mm -hmm. Weird New Jersey, UFOs over the Wanake in 1966. Oh, I already read that one. And The Difference Between Extraterrestrials and Ultraterrestrials by M. Admin, published to KnowledgeNuts.com. Mm-hmm. <sighs> I wow. know the end was really fast, but that's because that interview was lasted longer than I thought it would. And I wanted to give her time to make to her explain. point. Yes. Yes. Wow, Alyssa, that's a great episode. I, I certainly I think I can speak for everyone when I say I have a lot to think about. Right. I presented a lot of information. I guess my main question to you is, do you think injured cold is the same as those other grinning man or smiling man? entities i'm gonna say yes because she seemed like really laid back yeah and so i feel like she was probably just projecting really laid back vibes on this guy like she was like yeah there was a bunch of people in our yard with guns right next question you know yeah, like yeah. <laughs> she didn't really seem like she would be the scared easily yeah easily type. spooked yeah, yeah at all and it sounds like you know growing up they had a, a hard hand. She mentioned that they were poor and that her parents were having marital right. issues. So maybe injured cold like wasn't a big deal to her. Like she's like, oh, a smiling guy. Great. Come on in. You want to give me some ice cream? Let's go. Totally. You know, yeah. where the other people were like, you know, couldn't their their lives just had way less depth emotionally. Right. And so something you know, they perceive as different was bad to them where with our the woman that we interviewed, she had gone through so many changes in such a short amount of time in her life. Their stability wasn't the same in her family life and her personal life. Right. So a new character coming in wouldn't necessarily seem bad to her. That makes sense. And I also think, too, if if you are going into the situation of seeing this grinning man, knowing that the grinning man already has the support of your parents. Yeah. Then maybe your perception, to your point, is going to be way different than like Jimmy and Mouse who are just walking home and they see this weird dude smiling yeah. at them and they're like, stranger danger, this man has no nose or ears and yeah. run away. I think this just goes to show how important it is to have good parents. And if you don't have them, you can be good parents if you decide to have children or you can be a good friend or community 
member. You yeah. Because you really, and we talk about this all the time with mind matter interaction, whatever you're putting out is what you're going to get back, right? right? So like you're putting out good vibes, you're going to perceive and you have those returned to you, you know? Yeah. No, I think that's a beautiful way to end the episode. Yeah. And before we go, I just wanted to thank Bobby Akers of The Spooky Family. He is a podcast host. I saw that he had interviewed Tanya. And so oh, wow. I asked him if he could put us into contact with each other. And he pulled through. He was so nice. Did it so quickly. Oh, so I'm nice. so used to people taking like five years to get right. back to me. And then by that time, I've already done the episode. Yeah. So I just wanted to shout out Bobby Akers. You did a great job. Yeah. Natalia, are you ready to do our sign off? I no, I I'm <laughs> trying to think of one right now. Um, okay, uh, BRB gonna go to Facebook and purchase a copy of the book about Lanulose from our interviewee. Bye. Bye. <laughs>